Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the podcast. Our new narrative today is July 16th. And uh, before we get started today, I want to ask you to like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you're getting anything out of this. Uh, let me know what your thoughts are. Leave them in the comment section. I'll try and address all the questions and concerns or comments. I'll try my best. Um, today, I'm going to try and do two subjects in one. Uh, let's see if I can pull it off. Uh, so I came across a person I, I kind of heard of but didn't really know, but I found out she resigned from the New York Times, and this person is very wise. And I get her resignation letter is out there for all those to see, and I want to share that with you today. I'm not going to read in, I'm not going to read it in its entirety, but there are some. Uh, there's a few things in here that I would like to discuss. And I'm gonna start off with paragraph number three. Um, well, before that, uh, apparently she was hired by the New York Times about three years ago uh, or after the Trump, after Trump won the presidency and everybody was like, what? You know, so they, the New York Times was like, we need to hire some people to go out and find these people who voted for Trump because apparently they didn't know they existed. But anyway, uh, but the lessons that I'm reading from it, uh, but the lessons that ought to have followed the election, lessons about the importance of understanding other Americans, the necessity of resisting tribalism, and the centrality of the free exchange of ideas to a democratic society have not been learned. Instead, a new consensus has emerged in the press, but perhaps especially at this paper, the truth isn't a process of collective discovery, but an orthodoxy already known to an enlightened few whose job is to inform everyone else. Uh, propaganda, perhaps? It's sad, you know, I'm sure Bar uh, Ms. Wise was, you know, very happy she got her job at the New York Times and then now she has to resign because it's like, hey, she doesn't agree with everything um, that her counterparts are saying. She's getting basically bullied at work for just being a centralist, meaning she's not so far out there on the left that the buses don't even run out there. I forgot who said that, but I love it. Still in that. Um, the free exchange of ideas, man. The only people who don't like the free exchange of ideas are people with bad ideas. So keep that in mind as we go down um, here to another paragraph. Okay, here, all this bold deal especially for independent-minded young writers and editors paying close attention to what they'll have to do to advance their careers. Lockstep, baby, lockstep. Uh, rule one, speak your mind at your own peril. Rule two, never risk commissioning a story that goes against the narrative. Hence, this show, our new narrative. Need a new one, folks. And that's going to go into the second subject of this podcast here. Rule three, never believe an editor or a publisher who urges you to go against the grain. Eventually, that publisher will cave to the mob. The editor will get fired or resigned, and you will be hung out to dry. So a lot of us may think that this is a recent phenomenon. This is new. I mean, America, the land of the free, home of the brave, First Amendment. Freedom of the press, right? Come on, man. How you? This is America. What's going on? What's this novel thing going on where the mob is controlling speech? It's happened before, folks. So I'm going to take you back to yesteryear. And that's around 1850 something, uh, where Mr. Howard Hinton Helper wrote a book called The Impending Crisis of the South and How to Meet It. I encourage everybody who can read to read this book. And if you haven't learned how to read yet, uh, learn how to read and then buy this book and read. 
because it's one of the most important books in American history that you never heard of because the people who lost the war, the Civil War, wrote the history, right? So before the war started, this dude, Howard Hinton Helper, wrote this book. And it was outlawed in the southern states. Three people got hung in Arkansas for having it. Don't believe Andre, believe Google. Go Google that and come back to me. Um, and what's the book about? Well, the book was basically written by well, Howard Hidden Helper, wrote this book. He was a plantation owner and former slave owner who became an abolitionist. And he was, this book was written for the poor whites of the South. And in the first paragraph of that book, he basically said, I don't care nothing about the slaves. I'm talking about the, the white folks of the South. And basically he was saying, you are all getting screwed by the slave oligarchy. Now who is the slave oligarchy? According to our educational system, especially if you grew up in an urban setting, that's every person who wasn't black in America. Basically, you know, the way they portrayed everybody in America had a slave except for black folks, which is false because only at the height of slavery, only 11% of Americans own slaves. And if you can do the math, that means only 89, I mean, 89% of people didn't own slaves. And, have, you know, the Southern states, the Confederacy, was the only place where they had slavery. So 11% of Americans own slaves. One third of America lived in the Southern states. So a very small percent number of people owned slaves, right? Included in that small number were black people who owned slaves, okay? So our educational system has made slavery so personal that we can't believe that it was actually an institution, uh, an economic institution as old as mankind. Uh, but no, in America, it was personal. It's our original sin. Like, slavery didn't exist before America. Why? You know. Anyway, I digress. This dude wrote this book for poor whites in the South who were getting screwed by the slave oligarchy. And who were they? They controlled all legislation in the South. There was no uh, poor white uh, senator in the U.S. Congress or in the legislature of Mississippi, right? Everybody who, all legislation <laughs> went through the slave oligarchy. Look it up, right? And so they, all they did was protect their golden calf or, you know, the goose that laid the golden egg, whatever, their goose, and that was slavery. All the legislation was pro-slavery. Why? Because they wanted to keep their money, right? And furthermore, they controlled all the press, right? Now, what does this have to do with Barry Wise? She worked for the press. And that our current press is trying to contr control this narrative. And I started this talking about the narrative of victimization. Now this narrative is, you know, I'm seeing Marxism in it and all that stuff. I'm trying to stay focused. <laughs> okay. So you get the slave oligarchy who controlled all legislation and the press got 89% of the people in the South to fight a war to protect the institution of slavery. When those people had to compete against slave wages. Just think about that. If you are growing tobacco, right? And you wanna sell your tobacco to X person and your neighbor is a plantation that has slaves, you're not competing against the slave you're competing against the slave owner, right? Because he has a labor force and he just has to feed. You gotta feed yourself and you gotta sell your, 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 your profit, whatever. What if your, your product, right? He's undercut you at, at, from the jump. What if you're a blacksmith, right? Okay, Mr. John, I'm gonna I'm a, you know, charge you 25 cents to shoot your horse. Well, you got to compete with the slave owner who's hiring out his blacksmith at 10 cents. So how do you get 89% of the population to fight a war to protect the institution like that? 
propaganda. So pay attention, folks, especially when it comes to this narrative of victimization. This narrative of victimization is trying to usher in socialist, communist, and Marxist ideas into the American society. And pivoting a little bit to Black Lives Matter movement, you know, yeah, Black Power, whatever. Um, There's very few people who want to see Black people killed by police, right? Very few people. And I am pretty sure there's very few people who donate to Black Lives Matter, the organization, who know that they're a Marxist organization, right? So that organization is, is fraudulent, in my, in my opinion. It's a Trojan horse to usher in socialist, communist, and Marxist ideas. On their website, they want to dismantle the patriarchal family, right? And if you look at the Black community, since the 60s, what has happened to the black family? It's been decimated by socialist policies ushered in with the welfare state, right? I mean, a simple statistic of males who grow up without a father are five times more likely to grow up in, I mean, are, far, are five times more likely to end up in prison. Okay, you take that statistic. You look at prison rates before the 60s. You look at prison rates after the 60s, skyrocket. What else happened after the 60s? The, the, the nuclear family is decimated in the black community, right? These are Marxist ideas and they're being ushered into society under my name as a black person. I don't appreciate that, I don't like it. So we need capitalism to do, get a makeup. We need to, give a makeover to capitalism, something like pimp my ride, right? Because they've taken that narrative of capitalism being a, a sort of a, a moral um, idea of I work, I eat, and they turned it into some evil white man, right? So the image of the capitalist is just some fat evil white man on the backs of the labor pool, right? No. Capitalism needs a makeover. And we can start with you, right? If you believe in working, right? And being rewarded for your work through a wage, I think, and, and, and you get to keep your reward to do as, as you please. Maybe you save it, maybe you invest it, maybe you give some to charity, right? I think you qualify as a capitalist. I don't think you need to be a multimillionaire right? Jeff Bezos, I think he was a capitalist when he was in, the, in his garage trying to sell books. He was just not popular. I don't think people were driving by his house and was like, look at that evil capitalist, right? They started saying, look at that evil capitalist after he became very wealthy, so wealthy that he was able to employ hundreds and thousands of people who were able to buy mortgages for homes, who were able to send their kids to private schools, who are able to buy cars. All this stuff happened after the evil capitalist blew up, right? So we don't need Jeff Bezos as a standard for the capitalist. Capitalism is a state of mind, in my opinion. You believe in individual liberty, individual responsibility, uh, working, and you get rewarded, you know? Socialism is something like, you know, Andre, you work, and we're gonna force you. you to feed everybody else, right? Notice I said force, right? So if I work and I voluntarily give my, you know, wages or profits to somebody, I, that's fine. Um, now I'm not talking about anarchy, no government, no social uh, safety net, I'm not going there. Uh, but I want to point out that this new narrative, right, of victimization, of, you know, let's tear down the patriarchal family structure is not new, at least in a black community, right? Since the 60s, it, that narrative has done more damage to the black community than any Klansman could ever dream of, right? And if you wanna know the extreme version of taking away a person's agency, right? Which is all this Marxism stuff is trying to do is take away your agency 
to affect your life, right? We're, the state is going to make all the decisions for you, right? Don't worry about that. We're going to make, we're going to uh, bring everybody, we're going to equalize everybody down to the lowest common denominator so we can rule over you. We're going to make all the decisions for you. Don't worry about that, right? Here's the extreme example of a life with no agency. Neo, before he met Morpheus. I think some of you guys get that, right? Now that's the extreme version. But I'm gonna sign off right here, but we need more capitalists out there and especially uh, the black capitalists. We need you guys to stand up and not just say, hey, I'm proud and I'm black. You can just say, hey, I'm proud and I'm a black capitalist. Or if you white, I'm, if you're gonna be proud to be white, be proud to be a white capitalist, right? You ain't had nothing to do with being white, just like I ain't had nothing to do with being black. That was all up to the decisions my parents made, right? But you can make a choice to be a proud capitalist. And if you need someone to relate to who, you know, it's kind of hard to relate to the Jeff Bezos of today, but you can just relate to somebody who has that idea that, you know, hey, I'm gonna work hard, get paid, Maybe I'll save some money, invest that. Um, maybe I'll create a pro product that somebody will want to buy, but definitely I'll obtain skills that other people want to pay for. But here are some champions of capitalism that you may have never put these names with capitalism before. Uh, Booker T. Washington, Frederick Douglass, Louis Latimer. Who's Louis Latimer? Look up in the ceiling. You see that light bulb? Yeah, you know who created the light bulb, right? Well, he created that light bulb with a paper filament. Louis Lattimore created the carbon filament. And that's why light bulbs don't go out like that. When did he do that? He didn't do that last year. He did that way back in the day in the 1800s when apparently all black folks did was run away from whips by white folks. And with that said, I'm out. If you got anything out of this, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, to the new narrative, share this with some folks you love or you don't love, start up a conversation, hit that like button, like, share, subscribe. Till next time, stay safe. Peace.